Hello, and in March, the Register's been running a desktop management workshop. So here we are in the, in, in the comfy chairs today. It's quite cozy in here, as you can see. We're taking the table out. We're breaking it up for firewood. It's a little bit cold. Um, and uh, to discuss what you've been saying to us and to see what we can find out about uh, the way that you're dealing with desktop management in the real world. Uh, so with us to help with that today is Rob Shepard from Intel. Well, welcome back to the studio, Rob. A pleasure. Thanks very much. It's, it, it's cozier than the last time you were right. here. So I, I think that's an improvement. And uh, also from our old mates Freeform Dynamics, we have John Collins. John, it, it's lovely to see you at work with a pair of trousers on. That's uh, very kind of you to say so, Tim. John Collins, he's not safe for work. Uh, John, why are we here? What, are the, what have people been telling us about desktop management? Uh, I, I think the important thing to note uh, first up is, it, is it, it's not really a polarised situation. It, it's more of a horses for courses situation. So what we're going to talk about uh, here is, is more about how, how to identify the different user groups, how, how to decide between whether you should go all out and try and standardise and lock everything down or whether you should just go free and easy. And there's no one answer, so it's very important that you understand your own needs, really. As one thing, though, it, although it's uh, not a polarised situation, I've been looking at some of these comments and there are some strong points of view. There's some it? very strong points of view, absolutely. As ever, good old register audience. First of all, then, the most important thing is uh, refresh. What's, what are people telling us? So, uh, I, I think uh, if the people that have read our research and, and uh, the, the articles that we've been writing and, and uh, previous iterations uh, of the workshop know that there's, there's this kind of three-year um, point at which you've got to make a decision. That a lot of that comes down to just the warranty of the, uh, of the of the kit itself. It also is the bathtub curve thing. It's about you know there's a point at which stuff starts going wrong anyway. So your bathtub curve is that we go along the bottom there, and then things can start getting very very expensive. They start getting more expensive. It starts meaning you've got to keep more spares, and it starts meaning you've got to uh, be better on diagnostics. It starts meaning that you've just got to spend more time and effort dealing with stuff, uh, which potentially isn't how you want to spend your time. Um, you know, do you want to spend all your days with a screwdriver or do you want to be out there actually uh, helping users uh, get better at using IT? That's, that's the debate really, isn't it? And you're saying that that upturn happens at about three years? It currently happens at about three. It was shorter. Uh, it's been pushed to, to three years. We're not, we're not yet seeing any of the kind of Daiwu uh, seven-year warranty periods or, or anything like that that you might get in, in the motor industry. I think uh, uh, some uh, um, warranties are extending to, to four or five years, um, but it's not just about the warranty. It is also, I mean, the, the warranty exists because it's reflective of, of where people are prepared to kind of uh, guarantee the kit will last that long. So it, it, both of them are working in tandem. And warranty doesn't stop the failures happening? Yes. Three years is about what you're recommending? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's generally been the case for a number of years now. And uh, I mean, everybody we know in the past year, 18 months, has pushed that four years, some stretching it to five years. And quite frankly, some of the comments suggest some people they feel that's adequate. Now, uh, for a lot of businesses, that's not going to be adequate. And again, as John said, there's a lot of diverse opinion on, on what that time period should be. Uh, Rob, you would say that, you know, you would want people to refresh in three years because that's part of your business. Of course plan. you would say that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but is there an argument beyond that? Well, in terms of uh, why, Chief, why, why Why not stretch it to five, ten years like some of the comments we've got here? Well, I think it's all down to what the business needs and you've really got to look at the business needs it's that trading that balance between um, the equipment the control uh, of the infrastructure and what the business needs to evolve and be more productive I mean I look at it very simplistically uh, I know I'm being tasked to do a lot more work every day uh, it doesn't change from year to year um, gets more. I'm sure you guys are seeing the same. I'm sure a lot of our audience feel the same, same pain, the same pressure. So it's not surprising that the tools that we use to be productive are also being tasked to do more. And every year we launch a new product, people say, well, can we just buy the lowest? It's good enough now. Well, every year we have to go back and say, well, you've maybe forgotten that in the past three years, all these new foreground type of tasks and all these new background tasks are starting to happen. And especially if you look at full disk encryption, I mean, data security is probably the number one issue on people's minds. 
you need performance to do that stuff. There, there are, but some people will be thinking about that. But are the majority thinking, John? Are the majority thinking about that? I think that, I think there's another element in this, and it's back to the old uh, Nike model, if you like, which is which is that you, as, as, as a business, there's a business decision about what that organisation is good at and what it wants to spend its money on people to do and what it wants to give to other people to do. And uh, that, that's just a, a standard decision. And, and there's, a, you know, there's a lot of bright people um, in, in the world, in, on the register audience, there's a lot of people that are very good at uh, maintaining PCs. But is it right for the organisation to have an internal PC maintenance uh, uh, department or should that be should that be something that is subcontracted out? Um, yeah, what some of the people are saying here, there's a sort of an ad hoc internal PC maintenance department. There's people talking about using the spares from the PCs that have died. There's people sort of talking about repurposing the PCs from people who have been made redundant. And, mm -hmm. them, you know, and, and this sort of thing is extending that be well beyond the three years. And all, all for extension, all for you know making the most of what you got, etc., etc. Uh, but there is a a, a law of diminishing returns about this. So, you know, you should keep a few spares and you should have a few hard drives in the cupboard. You should have a couple of PCs just in case, uh, you know, um, uh, s some director's laptop goes wrong. You should be able to just go, there you go, mate, you know, off you go with it. Here's a new one for you. I've just re imaged it. Uh, that, that kind of thing is the right thing. But should you be running a, a PC maintenance business as well as your own business? That's that's got to that's got to be a business decision at that point. I think that yeah, you know, when we look at the comments, uh, the, the one comment here is saying how the downturn definitely uh, caused uh, uh, an organisation to defer uh, their, their maintenance to just see if they see how long they can make their computers last to the point of where they're not repairable anymore. Okay, but now they're saying okay, we're, we're, we're coming out of that. Uh, it's it's time to it's time to get things back on track. Keeping PCs going as long as possible doesn't count as keeping things on track. That's that's different. You, you've got to choose one or the other, really. Well, we we often talk, Rob, in these sessions, we often get the comments in from the audience asking how they present an argument to the business about this. Now, a lot of people in IT departments have been under pressure. Uh, it's well, definitely the response that we've had over a period of months. They're under pressure to make as many short-term savings as possible. Now, if they're not happy about that, What's the argument that's going to change the mind of the business that's saying, we need these things, you need to run these things until they fall to bits? Well, I mean, that is an age-old problem of looking at this year's acquisition cost versus actually the cost over the lifetime. Right. And when you look at the cost over the lifetime, it's, it's the maintenance cost, it's the, the people cost. And again, it comes back to John's point. Is it the right thing to do to introduce your own repair agents in the company? Is it best to do that? and maybe sacrifice some of the productivity benefits for the users or actually do you refresh and become more productive and actually provide the tools that make the people be more productive which help, should help to make the business more productive. Now there's a slight difference in what you're saying here that I spotted and it's one that uh, one of our respondents picked up which is are, we, are, are you keeping these PCs going for performance or a liability? What's desktop refresh, refresh about? And Rob, you're speaking very much about performance a lot of the time. You're speaking very much about reliability. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And I, I, I think that there's uh, a perceptional thing going on here as well. Um, in, in terms of if you're a... Essentially, a lot, a lot of people, when they look at their computer, they are accessing the internet, they're accessing certain applications, they're accessing files or file servers, etc., etc. But ultimately, that's their view of IT. They don't care about the gubbins that's going on in the machine rooms, they don't care about the networks and, and, and so on and so forth. So if you give someone a low spec, uh, low, sorry, not necessarily low spec because the specification is, is not so relevant, it's more if you give someone a, uh, a front end that isn't able to deliver the, 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 the speeds that they're expecting, they will feel less productive uh, you know that you just get those time delays. You just get those, you know, ten seconds to download a file rather than the kind of, uh, or, or I just want to watch that video and, and it doesn't work or it's or it's uh, clunky or, or whatever. And that is giving people a perception that the whole of IT is not working. And so it, it, it's not necessarily about giving everyone, you know, top of the range, absolutely all singing, all dancing computers. It's about recognizing what it is that's a kind of baseline level of performance uh, that is that is acceptable. Uh, and we'll get on to, you know, different users have different performance needs and, and, and productivity and, and, and tools needs and so on. But it, it, it is about understanding that if you, if you under, 
specify what what the PC should have, then you, you, you're doing yourself a disservice, and people will complain about their IT in general just because of what's at the front end. Well, before we close off this thrift one, I, I do. I was interested in one respondent who was saying what you all you need for most people in the organisation is Linux, Open Office, Thunderbird, that sort of thing. Is that point of view gaining ground? Uh, that point of view is valid, absolutely. And, and when we've when we've researched this, uh, and we, we did so last year, in, in terms of where, where Linux is appropriate, if you're a um, standard, um, um, you, you very locked down set of needs in, in terms of you're, you're just create writing documents, you're just creating emails, uh, you, you're not really um, doing much else other than you know, accessing a bit of the internet, etc. Uh, that there's a there's a place for just giving you a Linux box that's um, that's going to um, going to just just suit those needs. There's also a place maybe for looking at uh, some of the thin client options, some of the desktop virtualization options, etc. Maybe running Linux through those, or just maybe running a lockdown version of Windows. There isn't one one hard answer for any of that, but certainly Linux is is a valid option. There's there's no doubt about it. Okay, now so yeah, that, that's leading us on to operating systems and applications in general, Robert. It's one of the great comments that um, I know that you noticed as well was the uh, guy saying all the, all the new machines do is they crash faster because they hadn't sorted out their applications. They hadn't sorted out exactly what they were doing with the software that's running on that. You can't dig people out of problems like this. No, absolutely not. And it, this is down to bigger things than just what type of PCs do I need, whether that be a an intelligent desktop or notebook or whether it be a thin client. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a whole control of the, the whole infrastructure that, that needs to happen. Uh, John, you've potentially got some views on that space. Well, well. I, I just think it's important to, to get people to, to what is uh, considered to be a baseline spec mm -hmm. that's got um, everything that, that people need uh, in, in terms of... Um, if that crash, for example, is, is due to the fact that... Um, they're, they're trying to run too many things at once at the same time as uh, run that particular application. Uh, the antivirus is going to play a part. Uh, the fact that they may have, you know, these days, I don't know if this is familiar territory, but it's certainly familiar territory to me, when you've got you know, PowerPoint files that are occupying 10 megs a time and, and you've got 10 of them open at once. To, and, and your PowerPoint files. Well, I'm, oh, yeah, yeah, hold, hold my hands up to that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, you start putting it all together and, and, uh, and things will, won't be any you won't be any better off with new kit than you were with the old. But here's the thing, that quite natural creep that we've got, because we've, now we've got sort of a, a lot of people complaining about sort of Windows 7 being chucked into the mix and people struggling with Windows Vista, which was, uh, w which was great for, you know, if you wanted to buy a bigger PC, not quite so great for some of the people that had to deal with it. Windows 7, there's incompatibilities there as well. So it, it's always a bit of a moving target when we're talking about software. I mean, it, it's, I, I love the comment about uh, uh, people say, complaining that they, um, well, a, a, a reg uh, reader, uh, not so much complaining, but uh, t saying how, how people were complaining to him that they were stuck with Vista for another year because they were one of the unlucky group to... Uh, have uh, just upgraded to Vista, just, 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 just time, when, uh, yeah. and even though Windows 7 was already out, uh, they, they, they still rolled out the, the Vista because it's in the plan, mm -hmm. and so that, that's what we do. Uh, I, I think that uh, Windows 7 has got a lot more uh, of the compatibility issues ironed out than, uh, th than Vista had. The, what Microsoft did with Vista was they, they took it to a level uh, that further than they probably should have done. They recognized that. They, they've um, lined out a lot of the device driver issues. Uh, a lot of applications that were incompatible with Vista are now compatible uh, with Windows 7. There's the XP mode, um, which does give people a, a, a lockdown configuration mm -hmm. so you can run old applications. All of that's going to need extra memory on, on the box. Um, one, one thing about Windows 7 is that uh, while, while it doesn't necessarily need such a big processor as Vista, it does need a lot of memory. So it's not just a case of, oh good, we can use our old machine again. Um, you, you've got to but check from Intel's spec. point of view, Windows 7 is not so much of a resource hog. No, absolutely not. What we are seeing is uh, it is at one of those dynamics that says, well, is now the time to refresh because we've helped maybe we stayed on, on XP. Everybody I think, knows the situation with how that licensing is going to change and, and need to move to next next service pack. So do you go with Win 7 now? Do you wait for service pack 1? I mean, I know we're, we're rolling out 
Win 7 already. Um, looks to be very effective. Um, but equally, there's been comments in here about, well, it doesn't work with my old printers, it's going to cause me other problems. And that is part of the, n the natural churn we see when, when a lot of things are, are moving forward. But to, 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 get to, to make this straight, do you think that a, uh, an operating system upgrade should be a driver for desktop refresh? It's ever uh, go on, Rob. Sorry. Well, I was going to say again. There's no one size fits all. No. Is it a legitimate thing to decide, though? It will de or some I think people. depend on ha what your IT infrastructure and, and the way you manage your IT as to whether that's something you want to bring old machines in and upgrade them and have all that process in place, or whether you bite the bullet and say, right, we will refresh but we'll do it by getting the new PC, it comes preloaded. And again, it would depend on, does IT just take the standard build that comes with the machine, or do they manage their own build? There's lots of factors that will, that will help to dictate what their decision will it be. It seems to me like the cart driving the horse, though. Uh, I mean, to be, to be fair, I don't know what that noise was. Uh, to be fair, the, the, the horse and the cart, I'm just thinking it's very much about uh, making sure that you're thinking about why you're doing any upgrade of anything. So there's a lot of uh, uh, management features in, in uh, Windows 7, I uh, nearly said Vista there. There's a lot of uh, uh, security features in security and XP. Uh, it was kind of a XP Service Pack 2 and Service Pack 3, it was a kind of bolt on to XP. And now a lot of that is very much baked in to, to the operating system in, in, in terms of uh, what it does with security. There's a lot of power management features uh, uh, baked into to the newer operating systems. And similarly on, on the platform, it's, it's getting those two. So it's getting those two working together. So it's not just about, oh my goodness, we're going to hit a point where we've, uh, um, we're, we're not going to have enough spares or it's going to get expensive or we're going to have to extend warranties. It's also a more proactive, forward-looking, why don't we put in place a platform that we can manage better, that it's easier to patch, it's easier to uh, secure, uh, it, it's easier to, to access remotely. Uh, a lot of the, the, I'm going to mention vPro because you're not. Uh, it, it's easier to, to have that remote management in place so, so you don't have to make all those desk side visits. Uh, all of that goes together rather than just a, a it's about time for a, an upgrade, isn't it? Oh, well, I suppose we better. Um, why not take advantage of uh, the new features? It's difficult to wrap those savings, Rob, into the um, into the business case that you're making for a refresh. It's traditionally not been something that people have done. Yeah, and, and quite frankly, there's a there's a question about productivity and flexibility in here, and what's the return on investment on on those soft ROI items? Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, how do people measure it? I get, you know, yeah, and there's, there'll be people watching this now going, okay, tell me how to measure it then. That's a very tricky one, and you, you find the same discussion happen when you bring thin clients into, into the argument as well, because a lot of that flexibility, productivity doesn't get factors into the ROI. You've got to look at it, and what does your business need its people to do? And there will be different scenarios for different users. Maybe that, that provides a link into the part of the next discussion, but uh, different requirements, so potentially different PC needs and different spec needs. Uh, and, and then you need to look at, okay, what are they need, going to need to do in the future? What's the workplace environment likely to be in my company moving forward? Do I need to have more flexibility? Yeah. Cost of fuel, etc. Do I need to think about actually more remote working? There's so many factors, there is no one size fits all. But the, I, I'm not against the idea of doing, uh, you know, ultimately IT is there providing a service to the rest of the business. I'm not against doing a bit of customer satisfaction kind of work. And in, in terms of, you can't measure productivity. What you can measure is whether or not uh, people think you're doing a, a, a good job, whether or not the services you deliver uh, are up to, up to scratch, etc. And by putting in place a lot of this stuff, if you can demonstrate that that's increasing, that people are happier with their, their kit, they can feel they can do their jobs more easily, uh, or adequately, then, then, then those are measurements worth having. And you can report that back and say, well, that's because well, we put in place this, that, and the other. We're, we're, we're uh, finding it easier to manage. We're you know, up to a higher patching level, doing better backups. Whatever it is, we're providing a better level of service, which is what it should be all about. OK, well, let's move that on then to how you decide the sorts of configuration that you're providing for people. 
Um, again, there, there seems to have been a feeling that there's a lot of people saying, let's just keep this as small and as manageable as possible. I, I, so, we mentioned horses for courses before. You, you, you brought up there's the There's a lot of depends the Linux today. Uh, there's no, no more depends. I, so, without saying it depends, because I'm not going to say it depends at all. That's twice. In this. Yep. Ever. Mm. Um, the important thing is to know what it is you're trying to achieve before you try and achieve it. So it's not about it depends, it's about knowing the requirements, understanding so who do the you user ask needs. Then? Whose advice do you take on that? Because if you ask the users, they'll say, oh, I want this and that, and I want the other thing as well. Actually, I think if you ask the users, they'll say, I don't know, that's your job to tell me um, what, what I need. Your, your IT, you can't go into a user group and say, so what spec do you want? It's more about... Uh, going to, to the user groups, not saying what do you need, it's saying what applications are you using, uh, how are you using them, uh, where are you using them, where do you work, etc, etc. And you should have an idea of, of, of those factors uh, that uh, you can document relatively straightforwardly, e even, even big organizations, uh, you, you, you can find out who's using what and, and why they're using it and how they're using it. And if you don't know that, then you're not going to be able to deliver are on, on those requirements. But given those needs, it then uh, does come down to uh, being able to c identify groups of users that you can treat uh, uh, as a whole. And uh, so, for example, um, if you've got a call center, that's a very, you know, very easy to, to, to identify lockdown bunch of uh, transaction workers that, that have, have very fixed needs. But similarly, people that spend most of their time in the office just using office applications, there's, there's a good fixed group. And I, I think a lot of the feedback um, that we've had uh, very much demonstrated either organizations that get that or organizations that it's not that they don't get it, it's that they don't necessarily do it. So um, some say, well, it's locked down, um, we've got standard configurations in place, it's all driven by policy, some things work, some things don't, but you know, we're pretty much uh, sorted. Others seem to say, well, you know, it, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, but you've almost, you've got to go through the pain barrier in order, in order to, yeah, to make it easier. You've also got to look forward in time, what are those new user needs going to be? Uh, I'm not going to say it depends. It can be tricky to try and figure out what some of those new usage, usage models may be. Uh, do you need to put, look at unified communications as part of your business needs, as part of evolving your overall business plan? Not just lock down and looking at it from an IT's needs. What does the business need? Mm -hmm. What's, how does the business become more effective? Remember, IT, at the end of the day, it's providing tools and equipment that keep people working, keep people productive. Rob, that's aimed at the business. This is a more is better sort of argument because when you look at future needs, then you're looking at providing more and more stuff. Now, some of the, a lot of the comments that we're seeing here are people saying, we've gone through an era where we've been very indulgent <coughs> of user <coughs> needs or future software <coughs> needs. And now we need to pull back from that and lock down to a sort of a minimum effective configuration. Do you, do you see that in your business? Do you see that from your customers? Is there a trend towards that? Again, it does mix. It's varied. Um, but some some of them are definitely thinking that there weren't before. Well, certainly we see a perspective in the IT world as we've got to get more control, we're being squeezed on costs, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The only way to do this is we lock it down, we don't let anybody do anything. And then you've got to look at it again. What does that do from a user perception, user satisfaction? If you lock things down, for example, you could go to a thin client model, which may be fine in certain environments, but if that extends your, uh, your type of machines you've got that restrict your flexibility, to adopt new usage models as they come in, uh, then is that the right thing for the business? Because you may then be in a position where you can't, cannot respond. You have to do a forklift out of everything and replace. Uh, so it's about balancing this and saying, well, yeah, we may be able to squeeze this right down to the bare minimum. Is that the right thing for the business? Probably not. We need some headroom. We need some flexibility. For some of the people who've not found this appropriate, John, it's been because they found that they've locked it down to a minimum and there are too many exceptions. There are too many people coming back needing something else. Yeah, and, and to, to, to be fair, the, the registered audience uh, are going to be some of those exceptions because 
the kind of people that read the They're register. people. Absolutely. Uh, but the kind of people that read the register, no you are, the kind of people that read the register are going to tend to be the, the, the more technically savvy, um, switched on type of people that do have more specific needs. So it, it's not necessarily the most balanced sample. You're not going to get your, your average office clerk reading the register. All your office clerks out there that read the register, you're very welcome. And uh, that's, that's really great. But uh, I, I think that the, the real trick is um, to... Uh, to keep in mind, you know, it, it kind of if, it, if in doubt, leave it out kind of approach. So if you can identify a category of users that can have a standardized environment, it could be the, the execs, it could be the mobile uh, professionals in your organization that need a very um, um, limited set, set, set of things. Um, if you can identify them, it's worth identifying them, it's worth giving them a reasonably standard uh, set, set of um, um, stuff. Um, that they can then get on and work with. And I would mention, it, it, you need to think beyond just the, the computer. You need to think about how they're printing when they're remote. You need to think about toner and inkjet cartridges and all that sort of stuff. Uh, just but understand that. If you find that it's too vague, the you know, chances are you got the group wrong. Um, and you should, you should think again. So if, if in doubt, don't, don't just try and roll out a standard thing if you've got any uh, concerns at all that there's too many exceptions because you've probably got the groupings. So one size fits all, no good. Maybe five or six sizes fit all. I would, that go, might be good. I would go for two or three. Yeah. Two or three, not five yeah. or six. Two um, or three. And then handling by exception. There will be one group that, you need, that consists of the people that need lots of things all the time. Uh -huh. And they should be treated as such. So you might have technical support guys that go off uh, to, to customer sites. You may need a process in place that says uh, they're going to come to you and says, right, I need to be able to run that application. Uh, can you buy it for me? I need it by the end of next week, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, absolutely. That, if that's what your company's doing, you, you need to be able to respond to that. So there's a group that needs maximum flexibility, mm. and, and you need to build that in as well. It's not just about the groups that need locking down. It's the groups that need. Uh, the flexibility uh, as well. I, I was interested in one response from someone who said that you know, for those people who were exceptional, they went off and handled their own, their own, yeah, their own buying, their own support. Yeah. That seemed to work. That seemed to work for them. This is an well, inevitable. Well, it's, an, it's an inevitable part as, as well as some people outsourcing the management, both of the hardware desktop refresh and how their applications are managed, isn't it? Because you have to come to some kind of common picture of what the desktop's going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was. A lot of interesting, interesting comments in that whole area. I mean, particularly the one about the R&D folk. Uh, leave them alone. Well, <laughs> you certainly need to make sure that the, the, those who are very tech savvy have good flexibility on, on what they can do because they're going to be very pertinent to the business needs. Yeah. Uh, they, can, they can be the heart and soul of what your company is about. So if you lock those down, that's the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether two or three is the right number of sort of user type groups to identify, you've got to look at it from a, your business needs, how mobile is your business, task workers. Could be five or six, Tim, of course. Could be five or six. Yeah, you could be right. Like it could be right. Uh, I could be right after all, yeah. but, but you know, it doesn't matter for me. I think it's more a case of don't try and identify all the groups at once and try and sort of do it all at once. If you can start identifying one, two, three, four groups that uh, uh, you, you can treat each one individually mm -hmm. uh, and start rolling out specific uh, stuff to, to their own needs and that's already giving you more um, headspace to think about the other groups, think about the exceptions, etc. So Again, don't, slight, slight don't try and solve it all at once. Because you were talking about user satisfaction uh, as being a, 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 as a measure, something worth looking into. This isn't going to make you popular. Locking down someone's desktop doesn't make you popular, does it, Rob? Uh, indeed not. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I mean, what, I mean, we've t discussed it before, touched it on one of the webinars, but if you just look in, in the consumer space, the types of um, applications and social media that, that happen, and you're starting to see those come into, into the office area. I mean, Office Talk mm -hmm. being piloted with Microsoft as a, uh, basically a, a Twitter-type uh, application within business. Now, some will say out there, and probably a lot on the audience here will say, I don't need that. Some companies will absolutely look at that and say, hey, that's a very forward-looking way that we can evolve how we do business, how we communicate within the company, keep everybody up to speed. And especially as you start to look at the Gen Y category of uh, new employees coming in, there's going to be a levels, levels of expectation around what you can do. 
and uh, levels of frustration when you can't do it. So briefly, what's happening at Intel? Are you ending up using more of the applications on your desktop or is it more restricted? Uh, well, we just say so we're rolling out a uh, Win 7 at the moment, um, full Office 2007. That will move to 2010. Um, we don't. I mean, we have a. We're probably exceptional. We you have a very high. We're a very techy company, and we are probably exceptionally high on the notebook usage. We're about an 80% notebook usage. So, uh, and I know it frustrates IT, but once somebody's got a, a notebook, it's something very personal to them and you do see them customize it with lots of stuff so it frustrates IT. Uh, I think as you move forward in time you'll see a lot of that you'll see models that start to look at that not necessarily in terms of a lock it all down but maybe it's lock the business side of things provide freedom within a user elements and segregate the two and that's where virtualization and mm and desktop virtualization starts to play play into things. Yeah, uh, so again, we're getting to the end of things, John, but a bit of a word about desktop virtualization. Well, I, I, w I was going to bring that up because uh, I, I think that uh, right now we're at very interesting times in, in, in terms of what's possible with IT, and uh, it, it's still playing out. So if you do think of uh, desktop lockdown as, or uh, uh, client lockdown, let me put it that way, as there's a computer, what do we put on it? That's probably... Um, that's probably thinking too traditionally about, about the whole thing. Right now we've got application virtualization, application streaming, so uh, you can almost have a menu, self-service menu of, of what applications are available that have been pre-tested. Uh, you can have um, uh, the, the thing client model, the session virtualization, uh, VDI, where in fact you could be running any computer and you could have your work computer as a virtual machine uh, locked down uh, running in, inside a, a computer that you can have entirely open, your home PC, for it's, example. It's very so alluring, John, lots of Rob, is, is it crazy stuff that he's talking? No, not crazy stuff. I mean, you just need to read the register. There's lots of articles around desktop virtualization. It's probably the buzzword of the quarter of the year. Is it buzzword or is it something that people should really be factoring into these decisions right now, today? We look to this and say, well, for a lot of probably the forward-thinking companies, and we know a lot of people have been looking at this for the past year, 18 months, during the recession period, where other projects have slowed down or stopped. Uh, we know that certainly some of the large enterprises and government education are looking in that whole area. Now, is that going to actually come to fruition? Or is, oh, now we've got to do Windows 7, and now Windows 7 as a rollout starts to take, take over. But a lot of companies are absolutely looking in that space. I would still say 80-90% of businesses uh, will really be looking at a sort of traditional managed client environment for the foreseeable future as those sort of early adopters start to investigate and find out what works and what are the different options out there because quite frankly I don't think people probably understand uh, where the value is out of the centralization in the server, what delivery models do they need to consider uh, what's it do for their infrastructure? What's it do for their productivity and flexibility? And that's a lot of that's being played through at the moment. And, and I know it's an area that you guys are going to be touching on further mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. on the Reg articles. Mm -hmm. that's, John, we're, we're effectively out of time now. So, uh, to sum up, is there anything that particularly jumped out at you from the comments we've had so far? Yeah, I, I think build, building on all of this, bringing everything sort of, so where, where should this uh, be taken, if, if you like, it's that uh, people are needing flexibility, they are uh, try, tussling with this, how, how to balance between um, keeping control in IT, uh, because you need to, uh, but meeting uh, user requirements. So I've already mentioned categorization, we're going to be covering that more in, in the, the workshop as, as, as we take things over the next few weeks, uh, different kinds of categories. Um, but bringing up the, the virtualization piece, if it is about locking down, there's several l levels at which you can lock stuff down. So don't feel limited to the old models. Right, uh, it's not an on or an off decision. It used to be. It used to be sort of, uh, you know, sort of where on the scale do you have it? But there's, there's several different dimensions you can take lockdown now. So, so that's a very good thing. But the, the final point I would leave it with is this is only going to work if we've got uh, management in order because this is about uh, proactively 
I hate that word, but I mean it this time, understanding before, uh, before the event what it is people are trying to do and then making active decisions about giving them uh, the tools that they need. You've got to have your management uh, controls in place if you're going to do that. It's not just about giving someone the PC and waving goodbye, come back if your hard disk crashes. It, it's going to be far more dynamic than that. So starting to take those first steps down more proactive, active management of, of, of your uh, front-end desktop environment is, is going to be crucial moving forward. Very brave, Rob. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we're moving away from a, a device-centric world. What is it? we need to put on that with that particular device and it's more towards a user centric environment and getting the groundwork in place before you move to that user centric world is absolutely key there absolutely will be benefits for companies looking at the centralization aspects and, and to be honest that's probably where the biggest return is going to come but don't let that automatically associate with how we deliver that the user and what device they get it on. Uh, okay. Things are evolving. Okay, thanks very much guys, that's all we've got time for. So uh, it turns out that it comes back down to you, that's your responsibility. Now if you've got any comments about our comments, about your comments, then please let us know what they are and uh, we will hopefully see you again soon. So uh, from Robin, from John and uh, from me, Tim Phillips, goodbye.